Hello, my name is Adam Downing. Welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest with Virginia Cooperative Extension. We will get to the woods soon, but before that I want to talk generally about the, uh, the topic that uh, we're going to be exploring today, which is different methods to apply herbicides to kill certain plants. So the first thing that might come to your mind is, well, why herbicides? Why do we want to kill plants? And some of those plants uh, may not be desirable. And so we may want to control certain plants to get certain other plants to grow better. And we may want to control some plants because, simply because they are bad. They do not function and play nice within the ecosystem. And those would most likely be non-native invasive plants. And that's what we'll be focused on when we go to the woods uh, to, to demonstrate some different control methods. Okay, so let's take a look at some labels. Every herbicide comes with a label. Here we have a two and a half gallon jug of glyphosate. This is better known under the trade name Roundup. Look at the label and see what the active ingredient is. And here we see that it is glyphosate. Okay, and it also shows the percent um, concentration that it is, in this case, 41%. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple other products. These are both, with two different brand names, they are both Triclopyr a triclopyr ester, okay, and I'll show you that on this label. Here we can see the word triclopyr. The same product, triclopyr, is under this brand name of Element 4. It's a generic brand. And so let's look at some similarities. There's the word caution here and caution here. That is the least um, uh, risk factor word to be on a label. We see the same thing with Roundup, the word caution, okay? So this um, carries over into what is the personal protective equipment required. So let's peel this back and take a look at that. And it's one of the first things that is mentioned here. This says long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes plus socks, all right? So that's all that's actually required. That doesn't mean that you can't wear more. You certainly can. And there's a lot of information in here. I'll just thumb through a little bit of it, but not go through the whole thing. If we go over here, then we see a, a section for mixing directions. And mixing, by the way, is probably the most high risk uh, part of all this. And then here, the topic that we're gonna get into in more detail is application methods. And we see foliage mentioned, foliage treatment, and then we end um, concentrations to mix this in. And then basal bark or dormant stem and cut surface treatments. Cut surface is what Jennifer did last week. Okay, so lots of good information here. Um, and it is, really is meant to be read. If you can't read the size of the print on the label, then you can easily find any label online from a multitude of sites. The other important aspects in the label is where you can apply this. So this is um, specifically for woody areas. Um, this also has an agricultural use uh, in it. Let's put these aside and talk about personal protective equipment. And one of those is gloves, but we're not talking about gloves like this. Use these, they will actually absorb the product and continue your exposure uh, far more than if you had actually just have gotten in contact, direct contact, and washed it off. These gloves are for chemical protection, and the uh, nitrile is one of the key words. So that is one of the specific types that are good for use with herbicides. Um, rubber boots are a good idea, especially if you're treating areas like stilt grass uh, that you would be walking through. If you wear leather boots, then you're absorbing all of that into your into the leather and that's going to actually still be there next time you're cutting firewood or whatever, okay? Um, even though the label in this case only says long pants and long sleeve shirt, shoes and socks, uh, you certainly can be more careful if you want to be. Okay, I've got my PPE on. I've actually got more on than I need to have. I only need long sleeves, long pants and shoes and socks. First of all, sometimes you don't need to mix products. You can buy products that are ready to use or in some cases, you will actually uh, use products full strength. And uh, glyphosate is one good example of that, as well as a certain type of triclopyr, which is what I have in this little uh, container. So we'll be using this for uh, hack and squirt. This is a, uh, a, 
a triclopyr product called Garland 3A. And so this is, was just poured straight out of the jug into this little squirt bottle. And so sometimes you don't need to mix. So we'll put that one away. Um, and sometimes you're either uh, adding water to the mix or some type of an oil. This is diesel fuel, which is an oil. And believe it or not, it's listed as a product that can be used to mix with certain types of herbicides. And so if we were uh, using water uh, in a backpack sprayer, for example, um, be careful uh, to keep an air gap in the, in the system. So we don't want to put this down in here and, let, and then go fill it up. And the reason being that when you turn off it, then sometimes you get a little bit of backflow. So this is an air gap, okay? We have this space that's air. So you'd actually hold this. And you would fill that up with the amount of water you need to get the right uh, concentration. Whatever herbicide you're using, have a um, container that you can measure with and uh, measure the right amount and then pour that in. And of course then we're gonna close it up and we'll be ready to go. Um, I really like using a backpack sprayer for certain types of application methods when you're in the woods uh, so that you're not having to carry something. Last one is to use diesel fuel. Uh, obviously uh, with this product um, you can either mix this with water or with oil but for basal bark applications it needs to be an oil. And there are other kinds of oils that you can use besides diesel fuel but diesel fuel is the cheapest. One of the downsides is that it stinks. Okay, here we are in the woods and I have found a perfect candidate to kill. This is my favorite tree to hate, the Alanthus altissima or tree of heaven. And so this is about six inches in diameter. Uh, it's small enough that we could do the basal bark application, but we can also do the hack and squirt. And so we're gonna do the hack and squirt on this one. And which uh, the main tool we need is a hatchet. You can also use a machete, but uh, to do this, you simply will at a convenient height, make hacks into the bark like that. There's some fancy formulas for how many you should do, but my rule of thumb is simply to do one, kind of skip that amount of space, uh, the space that another hack would be, and put another one in. It doesn't matter if they're not lined up perfectly to one another. And uh, so let's do one more here. All right, so you can kind of see those as uh, those are little pockets. And we want to put in those pockets the herbicide. Now, depending on the time of year, you might have some options. Here in the middle of summer, I'm going to use Garlon. Garlon is more effective than glyphosate and also can be used during more times, more seasons. It can even be used in the dormant season, which is great, because it would be a lot more fun to do this in the winter than on a 90 degree day like today. But that is it. You just fill that pocket, and if you have a little bit of runoff, that's okay. And so this is a, a, a garland that is full strength. It is a garland amine, which is different than the garland ester, which we will use for basal bark. And um, the product is more expensive than, uh, than glyphosate, but also more effective. And so that's it. This tree is dead and just doesn't yet know it. So in a week or so, those leaves will start turning yellow. And uh, as this product makes its way into the root system, that's the objective is to kill the root system. If we just cut this tree, Anyone who's done it knows that doesn't kill the tree. The roots are still alive and it will sprout. And so what we're doing is killing the root system. Next to it, I'll just show you real quick uh, what I did a few weeks ago. These are, I got a lot of bittersweet vines in this area of the woods and I cut those and applied the same product on the cut stump. And so now we have uh, dead vines up top and this too is dead, which you can see by how easy it was to pull that out. Um, some of these can get pretty heavy, as you might imagine, with several gallons of herbicide in them. No need to fill it all the way up if it's too heavy. And um, these operate, if you've not used one of these, this is a, a hand pump, which increases the pressure. Um, and then uh, you simply use this wand to 
to spray the product out. And okay, so let's uh, take a walk here into the woods and look for a good candidate. Actually, I've already marked one. And you can see it over here with the orange flagging. This is an autumn olive, also a non-native invasive uh, species. And this is pretty good size uh, uh, tree, uh, bush. It's uh, probably two or three inches in caliper at the base and um, is probably about, oh, I'd say 12 feet tall at least. This is uh, ready for us to spray. And to do that, we're just going to use the, uh, the wand on the, on the sprayer and spray the bottom 12 inches. And you see that blue dye there. Now I'll need to go around to the other side and do the same thing over here. Okay, and that should do it. You want to get pretty good coverage on the base there and to the point uh, that's kind of running down onto the root collar, and that should do it. Let me show you a plant that I did that I treated this way uh, just nine days ago. You may see it already. See that yellow? All right, another autumn olive. This, uh, these trees, these bushes here have uh, been treated nine days ago with this very method, the basil bark spray with triclopyr, and they are, are um, showing nice dieback. And just to point out that one of the nice things about triclopyr is that it is more specific. You see, it uh, had an impact on some of the grasses, but not all the grasses. So there's a little bit of overspray here, but there's not much else killed. Okay, so the last uh, method to demonstrate, I actually won't demonstrate, I think it's self-explanatory, but that would be to simply spray the leaves, which is what most people kind of default to. And that can work well, but not on a situation like this. So here's another autumn olive that I killed uh, nine days ago. And you can see this is about eight, ten feet tall. If I had sprayed all these leaves, then look what I would have killed. Some nice ferns underneath it. Do some foliar spraying over here on Japanese barberry. A terrible little ornamental plant that has made its way into the wildlands. Has little thorns all over it. Um, in the land, home landscape, it's... Uh, value because of the arrangement of these leaves and it's often purple in color but um, so this bush it would be hard to cut because of all those thorns I'd have to get down there and wear gloves and uh, do a cut stump that would be effective but just more work um, hard to even really get to the uh, to the stems to do a basil bark treatment and so I simply sprayed the, the leaves I'll show you quickly what happens if we don't treat something after it is cut. This is a black oak, so this is good. We don't want to treat to this. This was a stump, and stumps will sprout of hardwood species. Uh, woody species, almost all of them will sprout. And so this is great. We're happy to have this in the case of, of the oak, but uh, if that had been a non-native and it was cut, then we wouldn't want those sprouts. If it had been a non-native and it was cut, we could have treated the stump and not had these sprouts. So. Sometimes sprouts are good, sometimes they're bad. And that's why some of the uh, mechanical methods are not very effective. Okay, that's enough work for today. Working in the woods all the time is no way to enjoy your woods. So I'm gonna wrap up my time here, my favorite spot on this property, next to a big old beech tree that is just nice to be under. It's nice and cool even on this hot day. I wanna thank you for joining us for 15 minutes in the forest. And as per my usual sign off, I want to give a shout out to one of our partnering organizations wearing their hat, Forest for the Bay. And they are a great partner in all things forestry. What we talked about today is a way to improve forest for the Chesapeake Bay. So thank you for joining us. And please join us again next week when Jason Fisher will be with one of his colleagues for edition number two of Piedmont Tree ID. Have a good weekend.